morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to this 8.30 a.m. session. Uh, to see so many people here is uh, really a wonderful thing. I wasn't even sure that I was going to be here at 8.30, so uh, to see all of you here, uh, I really appreciate, and I know that Don appreciates too, and uh, certainly is a testament to uh, his reputation and his work and, and everything that he's done that you would come hear this session on him. So um, I think we should jump right in. This this project was, was born out of um, research that I started doing after I finished the Eastman, which sort of started with Fennell and his archives at the Eastman School, and then progressed logically uh, into Donald Hunsberger. And um, so Don and I have worked together to develop this presentation. I've met with him multiple times, multiple interviews. We've had lots of back and forth conversations and revisions of this. So what you're getting is uh, pretty accurate according to him, I think. Um, and I should say that uh, Don Hunsberg is 87 years old. He and his wife Polly are still living in Rochester, uh, doing well, I think, for their age. He doesn't really do the conference scene anymore, but uh, still guest conducting at Eastman and just kind of doing the things in life that, that he wants to do right now. So um, just a short background about Don Hunsberger. This is not the best resolution, but um, most notably known as conducting the Eastman Wind Ensemble from 1965 to 2002. Three degrees from the Eastman School, music education, trombone and trombone, uh, a student of Emory Remington, and um, perhaps one other thing that people may not know is that he was the first ever chief arranger, the first ever full-time arranger for the U.S. Marine Band prior to his appointment there um, in, uh, in 1954. They had never had a full-time arranger, so this was a new uh, new venture that he was participating in uh, with the U.S. Marine Band. And with Eastman Wind Ensemble, uh, quite an accomplished background, 14 professionally recorded albums, which is uh, quite a feat, uh, and probably the most famous being Carnival with Wynton Marsalis, uh, which was a Grammy-nominated album, six U.S. tours, seven international tours, and more uh, celebration and Eastman Wind Ensemble Anniversary, Eastman School Anniversary, uh, National Wind Ensemble Conferences, more events like that at Eastman than I could even uh, include in this. So the whole point of today's uh, presentation will be to talk about sound as Donald Hunsberger perceives it. And the first way we're going to look at this is shaping the sound of a musical ensemble as a conductor would look at it or as a teacher would look at it. <clears throat> I think it's important to start by looking at the wind ensemble concept in and of itself. Uh, Hunsberger inherited the wind ensemble concept from its founder and inventor, Frederick Fennell. And the basic tenet of the wind ensemble concept is simply that uh, the pieces are staffed with one player per part rather than multiple players doubled up. And that the materials of the music and the composer determine the instrumentation rather than the instrumentation um, determining what the composer writes. So if a composer wants to write for three flutes and a tuba, uh, he or she can do that. Or if they want to write for a large symphonic man, he or she can do that. That's the flexibility of the wind ensemble concept. And so um, Hunsberger inherited this from Fennell. And Fennell said this, he said, we were to dedicate our work to the exclusive study and performance of original music for the wind medium. Our purpose was a clear concern for the artistic elevation of the wind instruments in the ensemble. And certainly, um, Hunsberger adhered to that principle, and uh, he took it and continued to develop it and develop it. And here we see Hunsberger and Fennell together. Um, they had a great relationship. Hunsberger uh, always admired and respected Fennell, invited him back to guest conduct frequently. Uh, but I think one of the myths that a lot of people think is that Hunsberger was just sort of Fennell's acolyte. Um, and while Hunsberger did inherit the wind ensemble concept and uh, a lot of things from Fennell and, and respected him, uh, it starts to become apparent that they have diverging concepts of sound. And so uh, we'll look a little bit at that. Is anybody surprised that Fennell's wearing that sweater, by the way? <laughs> so, um, so let's have a listen. This is a, this is a recording of the first suite that uh, Fennell did in 1955, the first movement. Uh, I want to encourage you to listen to the shape of the melodic line and then particularly really listen for the articulation when we get into the more staccato passages.
about it. Well, we have to hear it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it's pre-programmed, so there's no... Uh, but as we get to the end of this, if you listen, you'll hear uh, quite a bitten off staccato type sound. And um, Fennell even went so far as to paint uh, on the rehearsal room at Eastman on the wall the word short. And so this was well, this was his big thing. In fact, in an ancillary conversation with, with Don, he said once, I think short could have been his middle name. <laughs> and we'll see that actually short uh, gets completely redefined in terms of articulation uh, when Huntsberger gets a hold of it. And I'm not really sure where Fennell's short came from, but it may have been that he did so much um, large ensemble, large symphonic band work prior to founding the wind ensemble, and short works really well when you have a lot of people playing the same part. Single player part, not necessary. recorded in 1990. Um, this is uh, with Don Hunsberger, the same passage. I pay particular attention to the length of the line, and then when we get to that same staccato passage, it's a completely different type of sound. sense of evenness and singing style came out of all of that. 
So we'll listen to the chief, as Remington was known, doing a little bit of work. Uh, this is not the Eastman Trombone Choir, it's the IU Trom Trombone Choir in 1968. So you'll hear a little bit of his approach to sound uh, just as he works with them. This vocal concept is important and um, it emanates sort of out of the trombone studio. Here's the Eastman Trombone Choir. Listen for the breadth of the line here as well, gentle articulations.
Asperger's concept of ensemble sound. Um, we're going to leave out things like rhythm, pitch, uh, tempo. <laughs> Those things are a little bit more objective, and we'll just talk more about the subjective ideas, things like tone, phrasing. Um, so this is very much like the Remington approach, but he's using an orchestral approach to sound. And what that means is that the player is built from the inside out and the ensemble is built from the inside out rather than the outside in. So the player developing his or her own best sound and that emanating outward into the section and then out and that's what creates the wind ensemble. And that's also the wind ensemble concept at work, really. Um, we see the warm, rounded, vibrant vocal sound of Remington avoiding brightness. Um, so a lot of transfers from Remington there. Looking at articulation, um, Emphasis on the breadth and release of the note more than its attack. Uh, particularly thinking about the fact that the release of the note in most music is a much more gracious release, that a note can be very strong, we heard this in the La Fiesta, that a note can be very strongly accented at the beginning, but it probably shouldn't be that strongly released. And actually when he and I were talking about this, he was talking about do wah is a syllable you will sometimes hear people do where they play a strong accent and then they release his accent as they attack the note. He says, in most music, no, the, re the release should be gracious, full breath and sustained, and then a, a beautiful rounded release. Um, the same type of Remington, Da, or Do types of attacks. Um, here's an important one. Regular use of the tenuto staccato combination, and we heard this in the Holst. Rather than, just the, rather than staccato just meaning short, that it means uh, also a sense of, of breadth and tone, and what all that helps with also is a sense of melodic line. When you have a little bit more length on an isolated note, it helps to create a sense of line. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the tongue slur. There's an example of this in one of his orchestrations in your handout. Um, this is what trombone players do uh, when they slur. Any trombone players here? We should all know this, right? As, uh, as people who teach wind instruments. So, uh, but this concept can actually be applied to any instrument. Uh, and Mark Scatterday, current conductor of the Eastman Wind Ensemble, and, and my teacher at Eastman, has this, has this really great quote. He says, quote, notice in his music the use of longer articulations. First time I've ever heard this, he's talking about the tongued slur. And of course, as a trombone, trombone player, that's no big deal. And he's telling clarinet players that have never heard this before, and they're looking at him like he's from Mars. He says, quote, yes, I want you to tongue under the slur. But it was the first time I experienced hearing a conductor tell somebody to do what I did as a trombone player. And I'm thinking, gosh, that makes so much sense. So Hunsberger is using the tongued slur to again create a sense of line, breadth, and direction but also to help create clarity of articulation. So it, it, the long story short with articulation Hunsberger is that uh, breadth prevails even on the short. Uh, phrasing a melodic line, a lot of Remington influence again, particularly avoiding the bar line instructions or meter playing or note to note playing, um, avoidance of misplaced accents, which we've already talked about. And here's the biggest thing, multiple interpretations of a phrase can be used by both the performer and the conductor. And what, what he would suggest with this is simply that if you have a flute solo, have three different ways to play it. Have five different ways to play it. And bring each of them in. And there are probably 15 wrong ways, but there are probably three or five right, right ways that work really well. So developing the player and their concept of phrasing and giving them the freedom to do that and then working with them and coaching them through that if, that's, if it needs help. Um, I will also say this, multiple interpretations of a phrase by the conductor. My first, not my first time, but one of the first few times I saw Don Hunsberger conduct, he came in to guest conduct the Eastman Wind Ensemble, he stood up in front of them, he said, we'll do this a little bit differently each time, and the way we do it the night of the concert is the way that we'll do it. <laughs> I got a thumbs up. That's, uh, to me, at that time, that was earth shattering. But that, that represents Don Hunsberger and his idea of interpretation and line, and that approach keeps the music fresh, it keeps the players engaged, and it also allows for a little bit of improvisation, both on the part of the performer and on the conductor. So when people say there's no improvisation in classical music, there can be. Um, there's no question about that. But we often think of balance as, as conductors and teachers as, um, let's see, homophonic passages. What do we think of? We think of pyramid of balance, right? The high voices, the least, the low voices, the most chordal things. Uh, you know, homophonic passages, we do this. Um, what about uh, monophonic passages, solo with accompaniment? Well, solo prevalent, a little bit less accompaniment. What about polyphonic passages? 
pretty equal, but we want to give preference to new entrances that come in. So we're letting the, the materials and the music dictate balance when we think about it. Hans Berger says, let's think about this a little bit more. Let's also think about balance in terms of timbres of instruments. That we can not only balance based on melody, harmony, accompaniment, etc., but we can also balance based on the individual timbres of the instruments. And I think that, um, and I have, this is, this is from a presentation that he gave at Midwest, so you can look at that, it's in your handout, I think. Um, but the biggest one here is weighting of voices on the same line, meaning that the oboe and the French horn, I'm picking very random combinations here, could have the same line. But maybe we want the French horn to be more prevalent in that line, rather than just equal. I think we always sort of default to equal. Well, we got to get this and just get everything kind of. And he's saying, no, you can have a very vivid thing. For, uh, for people who like things like craft, craft cocktails and people who are foodies, sometimes you'll hear ingredients. People talk about ingredients. I say, oh, it's very spirit forward or it's very uh, something forward, you know, you ask about a, a particular dish or a, a drink or something. And so but we can do this too with how we balance lines. It could be flute and clarinet playing the exact same line, but maybe it's a little more flute forward. So that the timbre of the instruments matter, matters just as much um, as the other materials of the music when we think about how we balance our ensembles. He also talks a lot about developing one's own linear style of conducting. Uh, and he tells a story in the early 60s, uh, he was covering for Fennell, he was Fennell's grad assistant, and Fennell was gone, and Emery Remington came up to him after a concert and said, um, you know, you're looking more and more like Fred every day. And while Hunsberger respected Fennell, I think Hunsberger wanted to be his own person. And he set out on a new path of developing a conducting style that, that reinforced his concept of ensemble sound, but also was his own. And so I'll invite you to read in your handout, too. There's some notes of his that he gave in a, a, a presentation at the Royal Northern College, Northern College of Music in the 90s, um, which talked more about developing a personal style of conducting. Because just as much as rehearsing, and just as much as rehearsal techniques, and coaching an ensemble, the conducting helps achieve these goals, too. So the second part of this presentation, we're going to talk about uh, Don Hansberger as an orchestrator. And I remember having a conversation with him uh, about his time with the Marine Band. And um, he said, you know, I wanted to change the sound of the Marine Band. And I'm like, what do you mean you wanted to change? You can't change the sound of the Marine Band. Um, and, and also, you're not, you weren't a conductor. And I think our default, my default assumption of this, and probably yours too, is the conductor shapes the sound of the ensemble. How do we do it? Well, we just talked about it through coaching them, through rehearsing them, through our conducting them. And that shapes the sound of the ensemble. The Hunsberger says, that's true, but the type of music that we select and the orchestration of that music has as much bearing on the sound of the ensemble as our work as a conductor and teacher. And um, to me, that was, that was a pretty revelatory thought. I mean, I think about the music that I program, I think about how it's orchestrated, but I never thought that the sound of my ensemble is as much determined by the orchestration of the pieces that I select as it is by how I rehearse them. So uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. But Hansberger's contributions are, are pretty great. 54 pieces uh, that he either arranged or orchestrated. 39 of those were with the U.S. Marine Band. Um, and there's a whole listing of those uh, in your handout I invite you to take a look at. Here he is as chief arranger and trombonist. He was writing a lot of encores and things at that time. He was, he was bringing contemporary uh, uh, arrangements of contemporary tunes as encores that the, that the band would play for soloists and things. They had just added a vocalist for the first time. They'd never had a vocalist, and so there was no vocal, vocal with band repertoire for the Marine Band, and so he was producing a lot of things for that. And during his time with the Marine Band, which would have been uh, from 1954 to 1958, uh, he spent a lot of time working with Rayburn Wright. Um, and for those of you that don't know who Rayburn Wright was, um, he was uh, the founder of the Jazz and Contemporary Media Studies program at Eastman. So there was no jazz program at Eastman prior to Rayburn Wright. And he was also uh, the, the writer and then the co-music director of Radio City Music Hall from 1950s, early 1950s to 1969. Um, quite an accomplished career and, and quite an important person in Donald Hunsberger's life. They met in 1955 at an Emory Remington reunion and uh, developed a lifelong friendship. Um, 
with uh, also with Doris, who was um, Ray Wright's wife, and um, Don was particularly influenced by not only Ray as an arranger, but also Ray as a professional. Uh, Ray was the consummate professional, and I think that this um, this really wore off on Don Huntsberger in terms of how he handled himself, not only on the podium, but also in all, all of his other dealings, and in his writing, too. Um, and so his, during his time with the Marine Band, uh, Huntsberger was studying orchestration with Ray Wright. And he would, uh, he would record pieces with the Marine Band in DC and then take the train up to New York and have a lesson with Ray, and Ray would go over his arrangements with him and help guide him and help him continue to grow. But I do need to say this about Ray because his influence was, was so, so significant on Don. Um, here's a few quotes. Fred Sturm, who unfortunately passed a few years ago and was a, uh, an alumnus of the program at Eastman, said this of Ray. He said, quote, Ray's way was the real world way with the highest professional standards. He never dumped it down for his students as players, writers, and teachers, and a measurable gift to all of his protégés. Manny Mendelson, who was Ray's teaching assistant in 1986, said this, quote, with Ray, we did not study arranging, we arranged. We did not study conducting, we conducted. We did not learn to teach, we taught clinics. We did not learn to play, we played. And if I can paraphrase Don Hunsberger, what he would have said of Ray Wright was, you are responsible for everything that you touch, whether it's um, something that you organize or a project that you work on with other people, whether you're leading it or not, when you become a part of it, you're responsible. And in writing and arranging, you're responsible for every note that you put on the page. Have a reason for every note. And that was the Ray Wright philosophy. And um, when I think about it, watching Don Hunsberger work, watching his student, my, my teacher Mark Scatterday work, watching my experience at Eastman, I think, I think that the Ray Wright way is the Eastman way. And I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. I wasn't there. But it's, it's interesting to have done this research for me and to go back and look at all of this and try to understand the things that I learned and, and where they started and the influences. And, and Ray Wright was one of these. Here's a short excerpt of one of Ray Wright's arrangements. Neat, tight, 
powerful sound into a more gentle sound. Um, and you know how you got to have a break string and where they open up. And, but what I, uh, one of the techniques was to uh, uh, take a chord, especially like a four or five way chord, and put lead alto on top. And then the, the second alto, later the tenor, the higher may be down. Uh, put them on and then take the clarinet section and divisi them and spread them out around voice uh, three, four, five, whatever, and then an octave lower from the top two. And so you would get this sort of rich organ like texture that you get by adding a different stop. And uh, and also to bring the flute section down, let the, let the flute section play on the organ, sometimes just one or two, play on the melodic line along with the, the sax and get them to use vibrato and yeah, so he's he's working particularly, I think, with the woodwinds in that context. And uh, just imagine your favorite Sousa march, and how the woodwinds would have been scored in that uh, flutes, uh, clarinets above the staff, all of this. And he's saying, well, there are other ways we can make this group sound. And, and this shows up in this, which is probably a little hard to see uh, on the resolution on here. But um, if you can kind of see where the clarinets are here, this is a transposed score. But the clarinets are here, the saxophones are here. He's got the, the clarinets underneath the saxophones and interlocked with them in such a way that it's going to move us beyond that Sousa, Sousa band sound. Not that there's anything wrong with the Sousa band sound at all, but it's just something that's different. And so for the Marine band at this time, that would have been innovative. In 1962, 1961, he returned to the Eastman School to do a DMA in trombone. And he studied with Bernard Rogers, uh, who was teaching composition there at the time. Bernard Rogers was a student of Ernest Bloch and, and Boulanger. And quite a few pupils of his wrote for winds. I'm sure we, most of those names are probably familiar to us. But Bernard Rogers, one of his great claims to fame was his book, The Art of Orchestration. And the whole premise of the book was that the orchestrator could take each instrument as a color on a palette and mix them. And um, the fewer the colors you have, the more pure, the more transparency you have, as you go, if you go down this list here. Mixing leads to neutrality, increasing grayness. So the more voices you end up mixing on the same thing, you end up with, anybody ever painted, you ever see how that turns out? I'm not good at it. And if, now if I mix colors, they would just all be blue. So, um, so that's what he's saying, is the more colors you start mixing in, the less clarity that you have. And then finally, the orchestrator must understand the properties of each tone, color, and instrument. But um, one of the major takeaways from this is that context and contrast are the key to understanding color. That, that wall, here is red, but it would make more sense uh, against the gray as opposed to if it was against purple, right? The red would mean something different. And so uh, that's, the, that's the idea here is that the, the contrast and context is really important in determining um, how we reference these colors. So to hear a little bit of this, uh, Bernard Rogers at work, let's hear, uh, this is the three Japanese dances, just a little bit of the first movement. Uh, that Fennell had convinced him to orchestrate for wind ensembles, originally an orchestra piece. Listen for the use of colors, and uh, again, if you think back to that kind of early band music doubling where the low woodwinds and the low grass are kind of all doubled up, and sort of, you won't hear that in this. This is a different sound. Hans Berger working on his uh, DMA dissertation, uh, 
uh, thesis project, which was the, the Bach, uh, Pasakali, and Fugue in C minor, and then the, the, the Prelude and Fugue in E flat major, which is the St. Anne Prelude. Um, and so he's going to talk a little bit about that experience and what it was like in the early 1960s trying to write in an orchestration style that was different. I had to write in my thesis why I was doing what I was doing. And so I had to write a definition of the current 1962 era, uh, the current style of scoring for band. And what I was doing was a breakthrough because I works I did for possibly a few Sorry, I didn't work much. First, the same band very It's not just stacked trumpets and then stacked horns and then stacked trombones. And he gets this organ sound out of the group. And the organ thing is important to mention with him. As an undergraduate, he would spend a lot of time experimenting um, in the organ room at Eastman, trying the different stops. And you have to remember in the 50s, there were no synthesizers, there were no computers, there was no, well, the only way to experiment with, with sounds like that would be on an organ. And so you'll hear references to, to the organ and it stops. And uh, one of the things that he said that I thought was a really kind of poignant example is he's saying, up to this point in time, a lot of band music was just that you would set the stops on the organ for the whole piece, 
and you'd make a few changes. And what he's setting out to do is to create a contrast where you're changing the stops on the organ as much as possible. Um, he's redefining the idea of the wind ensemble in the 60s. He adds to it, this is underlying Fennell's, adds to Fennell's definition, the development of individual tone colors. So we had that kind of working definition of the wind ensemble. He's added to that now. This is kind of funny. Um, 1951, this, the, the Midwest Clinic actually shared this. Uh, this is a letter that Bill Ravelli wrote to the, um, to the Midwest Clinic, and it said, it seemed like the good old days to hear bands, bands, bands. And so the, the wind ensemble concept in and of itself was sort of revolutionary, and that it's technically not a band. Uh, but this was the landscape that Fennell inherited and then that Hunsberger inherited. And Hunsberger said this, he said, quote, I was told by, told by some old timers personally face to face, you're ruining the band. If the band ever fails, it's your fault. You're the one who is ruining the band with all the things you're doing. Well, Hunsberger's work was never intended to replace the band. It was never intended to be better than the band. It was never intended to be some elitist thing. It was just meant to be different. And um, this, is, this is a diagram that he uses. It, it's a very large tent way to think of the wind ensemble or the wind band, that all of these different ensembles really can't exist uh, underneath, underneath that umbrella. And so while his work was in some ways revolutionary in terms of its orchestration, it was never meant to replace or um, overtake the band. It was meant to be a part of what we do. Um, the, the, the whole idea of this repertoire that focuses on colors didn't really come into shape early on. Fennell didn't have the literature to record that focused on tone colors, and neither did, did Hunsberger for quite some time. But in, uh, as Hunsberger's career grew, so did the repertoire. And I think this album is a great example of this. So you have a band piece, you have a transcription of a brass band piece for wind ensemble, you have an orchestral winds piece, and then you have music for Prague on there, which could be played by a wind ensemble or a large symphonic band and work really well. But one of these pieces, the Variations for Wind Band, was originally Variations for Brass Band. And um, Hunsberger did a lot of study of, of um, brass band scoring techniques and that type of literature. And one of the things that he really latched onto was this concept of the sax horn. So uh, we think of the saxophone family, but also the sax horn family and the brass band, that you can have a full complement of instruments that cover quite a wide tessitura and range that all sound the same. And you can use these and orchestrate with them in a multitude of ways. You can create a choir, family sound from top to bottom, or you can split them off in any register and use them to accompany and reinforce a completely different family. So the sax horn concept adds a lot of versatility. And in his variations for wind band, we see him using that. We see him expanding the flute section as big as you can make it, from piccolo all the way down and adding alto flute. So he's taken the flute section and extended it out. He's done the same thing with the clarinet section, from E flat clarinet all the way down to B flat contrabass. Um, bassoon, adding contrabassoon. Saxophone family, using B flat soprano sax instead of two B flat altos. So what he's doing is, is getting the maximum range out of each family of instruments. And that allows him to use more, more color uh, within that family or to spread that color out at any range within the ensemble and put it with something else. We see this also in the brass. Uh, he's using piccolo trumpet and flugelhorn. So let's listen a little bit to the original uh, variations for wind band just to get an idea. Uh, this is the brass band arrangement originally. <laughs>
praised for its ability to homogenize and sound like an organ or all of the like instruments with, the, with only the addition of the cylindrical brass and the trombones. And that's one of the greatest assets of the brass band, but it's also one of its greatest liabilities. And Hunsberger says, let's take this and try something else with it. That English horn solo, when that moment comes, my gosh, uh, it helps you hear the whole piece, obviously. But this is, uh, the orchestration of that moment is as touching as the melody and the harmony is. And I think that's a real key takeaway when you listen to these pieces as they get orchestrated uh, across mediums, um, is that the, the, the orchestration can be as expressive as the composer's uh, melody, harmony, and, uh, and I think we see that with this. Um, so I asked him, I said, is it possible to separate Don Hunsberger, uh, the conductor from Don, Don Hunsberger, the orchestra? And after a thought, thoughtful pause, he said to me, no, the various things that I wrote, especially later, I knew what I wanted to do from conducting and from arranging, working together. Mark Scatterday says this about this. He says, quote, when I first came here and watched Don rehearse, knowing Carnival the year before and all of his arrangements and having done some of this, I watched the orchestrator in him rehearse other people's pieces. And I think there's such an advantage in having that experience as an orchestrator, because then you know what to do with other people's works and how to balance them, how to get them to sound better than just what the page tells you. I always felt that he was in a way arranging in rehearsal, not changing anything, but bringing these certain things out that would help that scoring. I remember some things he'd leave out or add in to make it better. I've always thought that those two things in him, the conductor and the orchestrator, go hand in hand all the time. So we'll look at one more piece. This is his homage to Rameau, and I apologize that this is kind of hard to see, but uh, this was uh, actually performed at the Midwest Clinic 10 years ago by the Eastman Wind Ensemble. And uh, if you look at this, this sort of sums up Don Hunsberger's orchestration in a lot of ways. You'll just have to kind of infer where the melody is here. But we have low flutes playing the melody in sort of a low, kind of luscious, sultry range. And that's paired with bassoon and clarinet and bass clarinet and soprano sax. That's the combination. And in addition to that, he says, I would like for this to be more flute and um, soprano sax forward. And I want it to be less clarinet forward. So they're all playing the exact same line, but he changes the dynamic marking to bring those other one, the, those other instruments like the flute and the uh, soprano sax and the bassoon forward. Here's another interesting thing. This is moving towards a climax, and I think that this really also shows this idea of expressive orchestration in that in, in addition to building towards a musical climax, the tessitura of the ensemble widens because the original piece, which was for piano, was written that way, but he adds color. He's adding the color of double reeds, he's adding the color of brasses and fire mute. Rather than just simply adding in voices, he uses the color to help create a sense of musical arrival too. This is sort of hard to read, but his flugelhorn is included here, so he's got flugelhorn in this arrangement, and if, as if flugelhorn wasn't enough, he then wants cup-muted flugelhorn. But he's again trying to work with every range of sounds that are possible. And you'll also see in this arrangement, there's playing into the stand, there's coming out of the stand. Anything at his disposal with the instruments he wants to use to maximize the amount of color that's possible. So I think as a good way to wrap up our time together today, it would be nice to take a look and a listen to Don Hunsberger putting this all together. So we'll, we'll watch an excerpt of a video of a piece that he orchestrated and then rehearsed and conducted with Eastman Wind Ensemble. This was at the Midwest, Midwest Clinic here in 2009. So seeing his concept of ensemble sound as a conductor and a rehearser come to life, seeing his conducting as something that can help lead and create sound come to life, and then of course seeing the fact that he's created a musical arrangement that in and of itself can define the sound of an ensemble, seeing that come to life. So this is the homage to Rameau.
parting thought. I, um, I really enjoyed working on this, this project and um, spending more time with Don, going through his archives and going through all of his works and all of these things. Um, and we got kind of to the end of it and he sent me an email this week. He said, he was very gracious and appreciative of the work and he said, um, you know, I really appreciate the way that you, you mapped all that out. You really made me think about my progression. And I think that's probably one of the greatest takeaways from this. And, and, and I was wondering if In Search of Sound was a good title for a while. And when that email came, I thought, I think it is. Because I think that summed up, summed up his, his professional and artistic career. And that he kept growing and changing and taking the wind ensemble concept and evolving it. And taking his concept of ensemble sound and evolving it. And taking his concept of orchestration and evolving it. And grabbing things and taking them and, and building is conducting and is orchestrating out from there. And it is a progression. And I hope the greatest thing that we can all take away from this in terms of our concept of sound um, for our groups and the work that we do is that we should continue to grow and continue to evolve. And like Don Hansberger, we should remain in search of sound. Thank you.